Hi, everybody. My name is Helen. Uh, I am here with Daniela and Alyssa, and we are members of a science communication organization called the Biota Project. Uh, and we're here to have a casual, I've been calling it a fireside conversation. So just pretend there's a fireplace right by somewhere. <laughs> um, so how about like Danny, start us off and introduce yourself um, and where you're chatting from. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Helen, for setting this up. And thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in and saying hi. So I'm Daniela Sarate, and I am coming to you from San Diego, California. I am currently on the eve of my graduation from a doctoral program at UC San Diego. And um, yeah, six long years in graduate school, and I'm right about to graduate. I study honeybee genetics and behavior. I'm also a first generation Chicana, Mexican American, a daughter of immigrant parents, and uh, from a socio, a disadvantaged socioeconomic background. So I never thought I would ever be a scientist or be in grad school, but here I am with these wonderful women alongside us today. So. Yeah, that's me. And Alyssa, how about you? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, Alyssa Abbey. I am um, newly a professor at Cal State Long Beach. So coming to you from Long Beach, California. Um, also Southern California regions. That's pretty fun to be close to Daniela. And um, I'm a geologist, so I uh, teach classes in uh, basic geology concepts and my research um, is focused on tectonics and how faults grow through time and how they interact with the surface. So whenever you're walking around and you see mountains and erosion happening, um, that's what I'm thinking about all the time. Uh, so happy to be here, uh, wishing it was a real fire and we were camping, but this is also really fun. Um, it's great to be able to, to meet up with people across the country like this. Cool. Uh, yeah, and my name is Helen. Uh, I am a marine biologist, have been doing marine biology for more than 10 years with a, a little bit of a policy background. So I am currently a first year PhD student <laughs> studying fisheries management. Um, and I will be moderating this uh, fireside conversation. So what I wanna start off with is asking each of you guys, and I'm happy to share as well, when or what was your first exposure to the outdoors and getting into nature? Um, I'll start with Alyssa. Yeah, um, for me, it was really early. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. My parents moved there um, for jobs and work and stuff. and. They were from cold places, Utah, New York, and really wanted to live in the nice warm desert. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so since I was a tiny baby, they would take me on camping trips and um, we would go hiking all over the place. And I pretty much thought like walking off of a sidewalk meant hiking. So I was always like talking about like, I'm going hiking. And I'd just be like walking on the grass in the park or something. <laughs> um, but uh, so I've always grown up with it and thought it was a really, um, and it, it was a very integral part of like my whole childhood. Um, we lived in an area where there were, the houses were really spread apart and there was lots of desert around. And so we just spent all of our days like making area, like moving around in the between the cactus and like trying to like make little pathways and pretend, you know, my brother and I even put stones in line and said we made a trail in our yard and we would take people on the trail that would, you know, walk like, I don't know, hundred meters or something. <laughs> um, so for me, it was, it was like part of my life as long as I can remember. Cool. How about you, Danny? Wow, yeah, that's so cool, Alyssa. I love hearing about like how other Biota members like grew up and their experiences. So I always feel like I learned something more about like, even though I talk to you like every week, Alyssa, it's always <laughs> cool to like hear more about you and your life. But yeah, I have a complicated answer to this question. And I actually have thought about this a lot ever since I saw that you were gonna ask us this, Helen, um, because I have 
a two-part answer to this question. And I would say my first experience of the outdoors was when I was 14. And um, so I'm from San Diego. I grew up in the city and I didn't really have experience in the outdoors in the first 14 years of my life. But when I turned 14, um, I moved to a part of, uh, I moved like an hour outside of the city um, with my mom and my brother and my sister. And we were uh, pretty below the poverty level. And so we lived in like an RV that didn't have water or sewage or electricity. And it was just out in the middle of nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And so I kind of grew up um, doing my homework by like, well, in high school, I did my high school years, like doing my homework by sunlight. <laughs> and if I always was like, you know, going to the bathroom outside, that was just like my experience. And I didn't have sewage, didn't have water our little refrigerator in our RV like wasn't powered. And so we, me and my brother and my sister would store our books in there. So we would never, it was like our little library. So we'd go to the RV fridge and we open it to like look for something to read. It never had food in it because we just didn't have power. And so I was very used to like just wandering outside and um, being out in the wilderness area. It was like an hour outside of the city, but at that point you were out pretty much in, in, in nature. And so I, would always like wander around and um, I would pick up snakes, pick up lizards. I would like check out all the cool plants and stuff. I mean, for me, it was very normal. That was just like how I was living. I didn't realize that was like super below poverty level. It was just like, I was living how I lived, you know? And my mom, I grew up in very rural Mexico. And so she was very used to like not having like sewage, electricity, water. And so we would always have our water in like jugs and we would when we were thirsty we would drink from the jugs and things like that we never had like utilities like we like I have now and that I'm used to which was interesting because I grew up like that and I've always been super grateful for very like basic things like running water and electricity and sewage but it did prepare me for being like a very adept camper and backpacker because that was just like how I grew up so it was very natural for me to like go into camping and backpacking when I started doing that but like my first experience of like actual outdoors camping in the traditional sense was when I went to college we had this program I went to Williams College in western Massachusetts which is a liberal arts college we have this like orientation program for freshmen where um, we all go on a camping trip with like a cohort of 10 other like new undergraduates and two like upperclassmen. And they provide us with all this camping gear and backpacking gear and we go out on a backpacking trip. But that was my first time like actually backpacking like how people think of backpacking and experiencing the outdoors with like expensive gear and everything. Because before I was just like living my life like as this super poor child out in the like rural areas and it wasn't until I went to college and I realized that people experience the outdoors in a very like comfort style where they go out with like thousands of dollars of gear because I was just out there you know like with nothing <laughs> and, and um, it was interesting so that was my second experience of the outdoors when I went um, for my orientation to college I went backpacking with a bunch of other freshmen and it was interesting because you could rent gear from the college, which I did, or you could just bring your own gear. And everyone in my group was super wealthy. <laughs> and so they all brought their own gear, except for me, which I, I had to rent everything. And sometimes I didn't even realize that like I didn't, wasn't prepared. Like I brought, I didn't rent hiking boots because I didn't realize we needed hiking boots. And so I was just in my sneakers for this whole backpacking trip and everyone was in their like expensive hiking boots and expensive gear and everything. So I felt very, um, very different from everyone. And so that was my second experience of the outdoors. That was kind of a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's very interesting sharing like sort of these two different perspectives and we'll get to the price part of this uh, a little bit later. Um, you're jumping, you're jumping ahead of me, Danny. <laughs> but I will say, so I'll just share my brief experience. Um, so I was born and raised in a city, so I'm definitely a city girl by heart. And I was never quite exposed to like the true outdoors, um, uh, except like you know to the park or to um, 
uh, you know, like the nearby beach. Um, so I would say the first time I really got to go outdoors was when I actually studied abroad and had the opportunity to study abroad in college to um, Jamaica to study um, tropical marine ecology. And I guess I'll take outdoors as like, outdoors like in an, a wide open ocean. <laughs> um, and we had to buy our own gear. So back to that price point thing. Um, but I had never been uh, in an, an open ocean um, ever. And so when I knew I was a fairly good swimmer, but um, uh, I was swimming in a swimming pool. And so when I was pretty much like just jumped in face first in an open ocean, I sort of freaked out a little bit. And I was like, where am I? Where are all the poisonous snakes and stuff? And but it was really such a surreal moment to see a different perspective of what nature is outside of the city and outside of parks. So I would say that was probably one of my first moments uh, in uh, the outdoors. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, um, what was a struggling moment of being outdoors. Um, so I'll start with Danny first. A uh, struggling moment, oh man, there've been several, but the first one that I can think of it, that comes to mind happened on that backpacking trip in college that I just talked about where I was this super inexperienced, uh, well, I was experienced in a way, like I had grown up, you know, very rurally, very, you know, I just, how I said. And so I did have that experience of struggle, but I, um, uh, but so on that backpacking trip, I had the most struggle ever because so I show up, right? And I'm trying to make friends with like everyone in my cohort, even though like I can tell that like, they're very like wealthy, you know, very privileged people. But, you know, I'm trying to be friendly and talk to them and everything. And so I like ask someone, I'm like, oh, you know, this is my first time backpacking. Um, uh, how about you? And they're like, oh, that's cool. It's your first time. Um, yeah, no, I, I backpack a lot. And they're like, yeah, I was just in Kilimanjaro, like National Park the, like last weekend. And I was like, wow, okay, this is what I'm, what, who I'm hiking with, who I'm backpacking with. And my greatest struggle on that trip was um, I didn't have hiking boots. I didn't even realize hiking boots were a thing. And so I didn't rent any from the college. And I didn't even think I needed some and I didn't even have like I actually didn't even have like running shoes or like tennis shoes I just had like normal you know shoes and so I borrowed shoes from my friend before I went on this backpacking trick trip and she is a size smaller than me in foot in footwear I'm a size uh, like six and a half and she was like a size five and I was like, okay, you know, that's fine, right? And so I took her size five tennis shoes and I went on a 40 mile backpacking trip. It's oh size my gosh. Five. <laughs> I'm a size six and a half and my feet were bleeding at the end of it. I was bleeding. My feet were bleeding because you were like, my nails were so crushed. Like my feet were so crushed like I started bleeding a little bit around my nail beds because they were just so crushed in there. And I didn't realize it was gonna be such an issue. And so that was my greatest struggle. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a good tip for everybody who is either new or and or experienced is always good hiking boots that are fit to your size. Uh, that's, that is, um, wow, <laughs> kudos to you for stress. For, for dealing with that. Uh, how about you, Alyssa? Um, I've been thinking about this because there's like different types of struggles, right? And so I, again, growing up camping all the time, that was like a thing my parents always did. Um, they did it because it was the only vacation they could have. Like they were in very poor families growing up. And so they just, their vacation was let's go on a family camping trip. And so that's what we did also. Um, and so we were always doing that, but my parents also are like not social people. Like they're not trying to meet all the nearby campers also. They're not walking around saying hello to people, you know? And so we almost always camped not at established campgrounds. So we almost always camped on just, national forest land, BLM land, like 
which, you know, good and bad things, right? You have nothing. Um, you're in the middle of nowhere and there's nobody else near you, which means gorgeous stars and complete quiet. <laughs> um, but it also means if you have a flat tire, then what happens when you drove out there originally? Like what happens if you ran out of water, you have to go home or whatever, all these things. Um, and so one of the things that really was a disappointment to me later when I would go with friends on trips, um, I one time went on a camping and climbing trip with some friends and we set up a camp again in this type of situation where it was like we thought it was great the we were allowed to be on the land it was wonderful we were there for days you know and one day we went to go climb and we came back and not all of our stuff was gone so somebody had come oh, by no. and decided to take all of that expensive gear <laughs> all of our sleeping bags, our tents. <laughs> um, we have we had our, you know, wallets and phones because we had taken them with us to go climbing that day, but everything else was gone. And our car was just like there. And we were like, oh, great. Um, so that was really sad because before it had always been like camping was just like, a, if people are out there camping, they're, they're really chill and everybody's super nice and happy and, and everybody's really respectful and, enjoying nature that was like the whole point of camping so it was pretty sad to have that happen and be like uh you know seeing this like bad light a little bit um around this adventure trip that we had been on so so that was like one really big disappointment that now which I never thought about before yeah um sometimes when we go on these trips you take all the stuff out of your tent and put it back in your car and like you it's like less of a, should we leave stuff here? It used to be like easy peasy, leave everything, do your thing for the day and come back. And, and now I'm always questioning, should we take everything and lock it up? <laughs> um, which is not a great feeling, right? To bring to that kind of like serenity that you're trying to experience out in, the, in nature. So that was one not so exciting experience. Um, and then of course, like the physical struggles like Daniela shared I think my worst one was my first backpacking trip. Um, similarly, first backpacking trip unprepared, right? Um, so we grew up camping, but not backpacking. My parents were not backpackers. Um, and so when I went on my first backpacking trip, I got, I had to buy a pack, a backpack. And as I said, mom, I have to get a backpack uh, to carry all my stuff. Like I can't just take my school bag. And so she was like, this is such a cool adventure. You're going to go. It's going to be great. I'll get you a backpack for a present. So she did. And it was very nice. And it was not the right size and not fitted to me at all. <laughs> so similar to the boot situation, if you're carrying 30, 40 pounds on your back all day, if you don't have something that fits your body, <laughs> then you're going to suffer hard, hard pain in your back and shoulders. And um, I mean, when you're backpacking, the point of having those backpacks is that you're not carrying weight on your shoulders, right? So badly sized pack, good intentions by my mom to get me a present, but um, it was a long backpacking trip. We were gone for four and a half weeks and it was very painful. And I ended up just like ditching so much gear because it was so heavy. <laughs> so that was my physical worst experience for sure. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny uh, that you know, we don't normally think about getting the right size equipment for outdoor recreation. So before I before I continue, I'll preface this. I have never gone pack packing. <laughs> I've also gone on one camping trip, but I've gone on many day hikes. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Whereas Danny and Alyssa are both hardcore. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> so um, I think, you know, I'll, and then I'll just share my, my struggling moment. Um, so I studied um, marine biology during my graduate degree in math for my master's. And um, it has, the field tends to be very male dominated. So at one point I was the only girl in my lab doing field work and there, had, there were many times where I had to do field work and I couldn't get someone to come with me 
to like help carry heavy items, drive the boat, uh, lift things. And um, I would say that uh, a struggling experience is being out by yourself with no one with you uh, and really having to think on your feet about like and troubleshoot, especially when you're out on the water and there's nothing around you and you have to figure it out all yourself. So um, there was one day where we were out, where I was out on a boat and the boat did not have gas. Um, and so this was a motorboat. And so luckily we always bought like a canister of gas, but uh, that didn't have gas either. <laughs> um, and so it was kind of like, what do I do now? And then like, meanwhile, so this was a, this was an, a bay that had currents. So the water was actually moving the boat further and further away from something. And I was like, I don't have any service. And so uh, I had to like flail someone down. I saw someone come from the distance and they were like, I, I had to like call them down. Be like, can you drag me? I don't ran out of gas and stuff. And so luckily it was a, it was a little bit embarrassing but like me being a small Asian woman <laughs> on a boat, <laughs> um, it was a little bit embarrassing, but it all worked out in the end. Um, I did wanna ask a fast question for you all, especially having been outdoors either for an extended period of time or even a, a, a day trip. Um, and I know this is gonna be a podcast too, so like, I'll say who has raised their hands, but who has ever done a number one outdoors? Raise your hand. Okay, so all three of us, Danny, myself, and Alyssa, who has done a number two? Okay, all three of us again. <laughs> so um, here's the other question. Uh, so we are all women here. <laughs> Who has ever had an experience of getting their period and being outdoors? And I'm going to, okay, so Danny raised her hand. So Danny, why don't you share that experience with us? Oh my God, yes. I'm so glad you asked this question, Ellen, because yes, I've gone number one, I've gone number two, I've gotten my period. And actually, I tend to always get my period when I'm hiking, like, or camping or backpacking, like it. And, um, I always am super blessed to, to when I get when I have that experience um, because I have um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is like a hormonal disorder, uh, runs in the family, and it messes with your period. Some women who have um, PCOS get their period consistently, constantly, like they have it for weeks, a period for weeks, which I cannot imagine. My sister ha actually has that. And some women who have PCOS don't get their period at all, which is what I have. I would sometimes get my period once or twice a year. And that at first when I was a teenager, I loved that, you know, cause it's like, you don't have to deal with it. But I later learned that if you don't have your period, you don't menstruate, then that raises your chance of getting like uterine ovarian cancer. And so then I wasn't super excited as you can imagine. And I also um, don't get my period when I'm super stressed and I am stressed a lot in grad school and like, you know, just life in general. And so usually camping trips are times when I'm not stressed, when I actually can like breathe and like connect with nature and relax. And so I tend to get my period when I'm not super stressed. And that usually happens when I'm camping. And so I tend to always get my period when I go camping <laughs> because I start relaxing and I like my hormones kind of start regulating themselves. And so I, and it's actually amazing because now whenever I get my period, not only is it kind of like a blessing because I don't get it very often, it means that my chances for ovarian cancer go down. It also means that my hormones are kind of regulating themselves. I'm not super stressed. And so I always take my period coming as like me kind of uh, not being as stressed. And so that's why when I go camping, I tend to get my period a lot. So I actually really enjoy getting my period when I camping. So I'm like, yes, it's like, it's happening, you know? So I have a very different like perspective uh, on it. Um, I'm trying to take my mom to Joshua Tree National Park in California next month. And she told me straight up, she's like, if I'm on my period, I'm not going. 
<laughs> and so it's really different. I understand that like other women have a very different like, you know, feeling of being on their period when they're camping. So putting putting a positive side to uh, <laughs> all right. How about you, Alyssa? Yeah, so um that's really, really interesting, Danny. I like that's a pretty cool um perspective for sure. And um I've I've definitely had my period while camping while backpacking and I think the scariest I don't want to say scariest the time I was most worried about it was when I when I started I switched over to um, using a cup instead of any kind of disposable material and so I was you know in college and all my friends were like you should do this you're a geologist and love the environment and I'm like of course you don't want to get stuff that you have to throw away all the time and I was like yes I'm into it and it was great um except for when you're camping and you have no water or anything to wash with right um so that I was really worried the first time when I was like oh my gosh I think it's gonna happen when we're on this trip and we're not gonna have running water like what am I gonna do but thankfully I had a really good friend who had been doing it like for so long and she she was just like this is what I do and so she just like has a special towel that is small and compact like one of those little camping towels that's like specifically for this purpose you know she never uses it for anything else and so when it happens you get it wet and you use it like a, a wet wipe you know wet one type you know cloth and and so if you you can you just do it with your water bottle right so you wet it and then you can use that for bowl, for whatever you need to use it for, um, like wiping your hands before and after and all that stuff. Um, and um, and then of course, if you're not in a space where you have a place to dump it, then you have to like dig a little hole and dump it in the hole. <laughs> um, but since then it's been, I mean, like my, I was way more worried than I had to be and it was totally fine. I mean, and I've, I've done it ever since. So, um, which I feel better about. Um, I had never had been, I had never been camping with my period when I hadn't switched over. And I feel like having to like pack that into a bag and carry it with you forever, I don't know, seems less appealing to me than being able to, to use a cup and a towel. <laughs> women helping women, you know? <laughs> I, I will say, um, having not done day trips or multi-day trips, I'm usually the one that has extra pads for the other women in the, <laughs> the hiking group too, but it kind of makes me wonder like, I should be more environmentally conscious. So, um, <laughs> so just moving on to uh, the next sort of question. Um, so we mentioned about price, uh, expensive equipment, um, and I just want to share some, uh, stats with you about cost of equipment and cost of hikes. So I actually, um, calculated the amount of how much stuff costs from my last hiking trip, um, which was a day trip up in the upstate Northeast area. So with gas of a round trip, uh, trip, <laughs> plus admissions to get to the trailhead to the park, plus your hiking boots, which we all know we need really good ones that fit well, uh, plus a jacket, cause it was pretty rainy-ish slash cold, a water bottle, cause we all know we need to get hydrated, food, uh, snacks, and a good backpack, which Alyssa alluded to, easily can cost over a hundred dollars for one hiking trip. And I, I wanna pose this question to you all. Um, is the outdoors truly free? I'll start with Alyssa. Well, depends, right? Um, if you just see the outdoors, right? I mean, Daniela shared with us that amazing story of like her high school years, um, living in a space that was very open and outdoors, right? Um, but you're right, all the protected spaces, like you were talking about a permit to get into places, all of these beautiful protected places that people 
talk about and advertise about and say, you have to go here, you know, <laughs> um, they're usually, there is a cost because they're trying to maintain it. They're trying to have uh, rangers and forest st stations and things like that. And they have to somehow keep them running, um, keep water running if you want to have running bathrooms or even just trash pickup, things like that, right? So it's really hard to make it not, um, to make it free. There are BLM land, national forest land. You don't have to get permits to go on those, but then you also don't get all those other amenities. Uh, if you want an established campsite, you have to pay for it. The gear, right? So yes, Hiking boats and backpacks and water bottles cost a lot, but if you plan on hiking more than once, you don't have to buy those again. So that's pretty nice. And usually, if you buy something that is good quality, like the hiking boots that will fit and things like that, and the backpack that fits, it will last decades. I mean, I have hiking shoes that I have had since I was 13. So, you know, 30. Now, uh, <laughs> we're talking like t like a long time and I'm still gonna wear those, you know? Like my backpacking pack, I did get a fitted one after my mom got me this other one. And I've had that one for like 12 years now, you know? And like, so, and they all still work great. I mean, they're, they had some scratches and some patches, but that's part of the fun right, to make it yours, right? Um, and so true, the gear itself is hard to, pay for if you're only going to go on a one time trip. Um, but thankfully it lasts a long time. Um, there's also a lot of really cool programs to help pay for that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of like outdoor uh, gear companies that do, you know, these different sales, like maybe one thing was missing some, some string that was supposed to be attached to it and you don't need it for anything. And so all of a sudden the price drops like 50%, you know, that's a huge. So like the garage sales that these things do, they call them or like these, you know, weird, you know, misprint sales. Like I love those, you know, <laughs> ugly color sale, done, I'm in. Bright, bright green, hell yeah, you know, like <laughs> whatever, right? Um, and so that helps, but I would say like at this point, well, I don't know if anything is free, but, um, yeah, I think it's pretty hard to say the outdoors, to have an experience like what we've been talking about and feel comfortable is pretty hard to do on a zero budget. Danny, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I agree that like what is free in this capitalistic <laughs> consumerist society, right? Um, I appreciate your optimism though, Alyssa. Like I appreciate you putting like a positive spin on things. And uh, I do appreciate that. Um, growing up like how I did super below the poverty level. And uh, I definitely am a little bit more bitter. <laughs> and I definitely feel like the outdoors is not free at all because um, it's not just a matter of the gear, right? It's about your time, right? Like you, like, I, I think of my mom a lot. My mom works like sometimes seven days a week. And when she, she's a housekeeper and she's a, a cook as well. And so it's so hard for me to like plan a camping trip for her because um, I have to grab one of the days that she isn't working, which is like, she doesn't, she works seven days a week every other week so only she gets one day like a uh, rest every other week and when she does get that day of rest it's like she has tons of things to do you know she, she's not thinking about going on a camping trip to Joshua Tree and so I have to like really 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 plan that out in advance and convince her to do this with me and so it's about also your own time right because you have to also if you're working that much that means you're probably not working um you're not making a lot of money. And so you have to really think about being like taking that time to, to have fun. And then like on top of that, all the costs, like the gas to get there, right? Even having a car that can get you there, you know, like I have definitely driven some janky cars in my life and some that I would not trust like going more than a hundred miles. And even if you don't go more than hundred miles, you go like 15 minutes to your local state park or whatever. 
even then that's gas money even then that's time and even if you're like i'll take the bus the bus costs money as well and it also takes longer time and time in this society is money so it's it's a very difficult question so again as i said i'm bitter so <laughs> maybe that's a very like bitter answer but it's things i think about no those are all great responses and i appreciate the optimism because it's like right these places need to have some sort of budget to make it to keep running and be beautiful my next question uh we'll start with a, a statistic that i found so the uh national park service which is part of the department of interior um you know there's over 419 parks throughout the united states um there was a 10-year survey that was done um and so this so and the report came out last year and from that survey um out of all the visitors that visited these national parks just 23 percent of those visitors were uh to those parks were people of color um so i want to ask you guys is the outdoors diverse is it uh equitable is it inclusive um so i'm gonna start with danny oh that is a sobering statistic and i am not surprised i'm sure none of us are surprised at that statistic because when you go out there it is a pretty homogenous group that's out there hiking and yes like i am so i'm chicana I'm mexican-american and uh, i don't see a lot of diversity out on the trail especially like on more um in more remote areas like sequoia yosemite um, and particularly when I'm on like backpacking trails where the, the gear costs are very prohibitive. And because of that, I would say like it is, it tends to not be diverse, just like academia is not diverse, just like science and engineering fields aren't diverse because there are so many societal barriers to inclusion in those fields. Um, and like I said, there's just so many barriers to having like a great like outdoors, like a rural backpacking experience that are socioeconomic in nature. And in this society, um, yeah, like race and class definitely combines to, um, to create situations where certain groups, certain peoples aren't as able to go out there and in experience the outdoors as some more privileged groups so yeah long story short it is definitely a field that needs diversifying but i have optimism that we can get out there how about you Alyssa? well um for those of you who are listening and not necessarily seeing this, I am a white woman. So um, it's very obvious to me when I'm walking around um, and when I go on these trips, my partner is also a white, he's a white man. And, um, and it's very noticeable. We walk around and everybody else we see is like us. Um, and actually something that was really interesting that kind of like opened the my eyes a little bit was after moving to Southern California, kind of like what you were talking about, Danny, when you get to the farther away places, you really see that lack of diversity. And in Southern California, there's lots and lots of really close local parks. And in COVID specifically, everybody's trying to be outside when they can. And so we started exploring some of these really local parks that are close, you know, again, you, you maybe have to drive a little bit, um, I was able to bike to one, which was pretty cool, um, but you kind of have to drive. And, um, but there was a big difference. Um, and it was really cool because actually all of the times I had been camping and backpacking and hiking, it was like, you know, a very non-diverse group of people. And when I went to some of these local parks, the people I was seeing were different. And it, so that was actually really cool and obvious, you know, all of a sudden I was like, something is different about what I normally do. You know, I'm normally backpacking, I'm normally hiking around and something is different. And then you put your finger on it. Oh, there's a lot of other different people here than I normally see. And so that's like been really huge because now I really notice it outside 
when I go to those farther away places. Um, and so hopefully we can start, you know, it looks like the local parks are, are being successful <laughs> um, at, at being places where these people feel welcome and comfortable and go, which is awesome. Um, and so, yeah, figuring out a way to, to expand that and say, you know what, try farther. Or like, maybe you don't not need all this really fancy stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I have, I've thought about this a lot because as much, I love outdoors and I love it, love it, love it. And so I thought about, can you, can I get involved with programs where you're taking young children from these groups of people who don't get to experience it that I don't see when I'm out there, you know, <laughs> can I bring them with me? You know, like <laughs> this kind of thing. So this has been like something I thought about a lot, especially in the last year and a half, because the only activity I could do was go outside and camp in the middle of nowhere. And so it was, it was really obvious. No, right. I, oh, go ahead, Danny. Yeah, can I just say something else? Um, is cause I think about this question a lot in terms of like the, particularly like the socioeconomic barriers to go outside into the in, outdoors. But um, lately I've definitely been thinking a lot more about just like how people don't go outside because not because they can't in terms of like economics, but because they are scared to because so many things can happen to people who don't look like everyone else in areas like that. And like, you know, we just have seen like a historic moment, right? In US history with the Sherrick Chauvin trial that amazingly he, Derek Chauvin, right, like got convicted, but, um, you know, justice doesn't play out for everyone. And in spaces like that, where you're like, not, don't look like everyone else. And I definitely feel like I don't look like everyone else when I go out there. Um, you know, I can definitely see why people, some people don't, would, wouldn't want to go out there and they would not want to put themselves in places where their safety is threatened. And also, um, I'm not just talking about people of color, I'm talking about women as well. I saw recently a post on a Facebook group, like a hiking Facebook group about how there's this, um, this predator like spotted on hiking trails with warnings for women not to hike alone. And that he, this predator, like convicted predator has approached um, single women hiking and, or, you know, women hiking alone and tried to like, do stuff and that is super scary because I've definitely hiked alone I'm sure all of us here have hiked alone at some point and that's something to think about as well yeah I appreciate both your um ideas and thoughts about this so uh for the audio part I am Asian American and I've definitely stuck out like a sore thumb many times, especially hiking by myself. Um, and it can be really isolating, right? And I think um, as Alyssa alluded to, there are programs out there that are making it more and more accessible. Um, it's an accessible accessibility part on like the gear that you need to go outdoors, et cetera, because we, we've just talked about that it's very expensive sometimes. Um, but also access to it, how to get front, how to get to those parks. Um, and I think there's a lot of studies that show that like being in nature helps one mental health. And so there's a lot of value of being outdoors as well. And so being able to, to help people experience that and get at least like some exposure to it can really benefit one health. Um, both physically and mentally. So if we can ever, if we are working towards that, which I know we are in making the outdoors equitable and inclusive, um, I think everybody would be in a very positive space. Um, just gonna round out our conversation here. We talked about uh, access and we talked about price. Are there other ways that we can break down these obstacles, especially for younger people or kids who are, have, you know, who don't have that easy access or can't drive yet? Um, do you guys have one or two suggestions in breaking down those obstacles? I'll start with Alyssa. Well, so as far as like transportation to those places and, and things, um, 
it's definitely going to be easier if you have an organization in like a bus or something like that to organize those kinds of trips. But also, like Daniela was saying, the you're like, it's kind of scary if you don't grow up doing it, right? And I've met like a lot of young people who, you know, you get, why would I go there? I'll get dirty. What if there's a poisonous thing that eats me? What if, you know, all these things that like you kind of hear about as like these horrors um, that don't really happen that much, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but that get like amplified, right? Like I have the same problem with water. I grew up in the desert. I don't like water. I don't want to be on the water. Helen, you're a hero for being We are on the two open different water. people. <laughs> I know. I know. So when you talk about like your experience on the water, I'm like, thank goodness I've never done that because I don't want to do that um, because I'm afraid. And it's like, there's so many things like unknown stuff, sharks and fish and blah. how many times do people get bitten by sharks? Well, not very often. So why am I afraid of it? But I can go hiking and see a rattlesnake and be like, whatever, you just walk around it, you know, like, like, because that's what I grew up with. And I knew, I know what to do in those situations. And so I think something that would be really cool and helpful is to, even if it's not in the middle of nowhere, even if you don't have to do like big transportation stuff is like relate the experiences that you have in the middle of nowhere in these situations two things that young people are experiencing in the city, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels, right? Um, and so like kind of demystifying <laughs> the scary stuff that exists out there. Um, I feel like, you know, in general, I'm a lot more scared of things in a city where there's lots of people and lots of cars and things happening than when I'm out in the middle of nowhere and like, yeah, okay, maybe I'll get bit by a mosquito, but like I feel better about that than a lot of other things that I'm exposed to in the city. And so kind of like making that realization happen somehow, either by experiences in local parks, like actually bringing some of those animals and plants into classrooms or areas where students can see them and see that they're not too scary. Um, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, because I, I mean, I think like that's a big, reason why if somebody had the opportunity you know had the transportation had the, somebody loaning gear to them or something like that that they'd be like I don't want to because it's scary um so I met a lot a lot of kids especially like you know eight to 15 year olds is what I'm thinking you know that like age range that are just so averse to thinking about being out there you know, you're dirty, you're gross, you things, you know, there's weird, scary animals, like that kind of stuff is, is huge. And it's, it's like the unknown, the fear of the unknown, right? So making it known. <laughs> Good advice there. Uh, what about you, Danny? One or two suggestions on making the outdoors truly inclusive? Ooh, that is a great question, Helen. And yeah, I think Alyssa just killed it with with the with how to make the outdoors accessible. I can't think of too many other things um, outside of what Alyssa said, but you know, it is a it's a hard question, right? It's a super hard question uh, considering how many factors are involved, and I can't see like a true solution to that truly making the outdoors accessible without like a complete overthrow of our capitalistic society. But that's just me. Um, in terms of like uh, realistic approaches to making the outdoors accessible. Yes, I would just have to echo Alyssa's statements about one, um, prepping, you know, youth prepping people to be in the outdoors. Like uh, I know different um, outdoors retail stores like REI have like mountaineering courses and like navigation courses and learning how to like use a map, how to use a compass, how to use all this gear, what this gear is, what gear is even available out there for you to use. Just um, really educating people about how to survive in the outdoors, even things like um, how to, like what kind of things to eat out there. There's a lot of edible and usable plants out there that you know indigenous people have used for millennia 
that we have no idea, right? There are people out there who have lived in places we consider inhosp inhospitable, you know, and they could have survived out there because they know all the plants, they know the sources of water, they know how to feed themselves, how to clothe themselves, right? And so some of us, like me included, would have no idea how to like survive out there if I didn't have my, you know, energy bars and <laughs> my filter. So, um, yeah, that and also, yeah, bring the outdoors to people who can access it. And I'm not talking about uh, just people who can't access it because of socioeconomic um, disadvantages, but also disability, right? Like I know uh, people who aren't able to hike, like maybe they're in a wheelchair, maybe they just can't have, you know, be out in the outdoors for whatever reason, they just can't hike. And so, you know, uh, incorporating things in like, uh, standard education curricula, like, you know, outdoor stuff, like um, introducing people to just outdoor spaces, outdoor uh, biology, and like everything that goes, all the science that comes with um, being in the outdoors. So um, yeah, I just, those are my thoughts, but I think Alyssa just knocked it out of the park with that one. All very good thoughts. Uh, well, so I want to say thanks to you gals for being part of this conversation, and I want to end it with something a little fun. So I asked everybody to bring or highlight something that uh, is outdoors related and share that. Um, so this actually might be like an add on slash separate segment. So I'm going to start. Um, I am a rock climber. I rock climb mostly indoors, but I've done it outdoors. And so I want to share that also I got these on sale. So there are tons of sales out there. <laughs> um, I want to share my rock climbing shoes, which are very different from regular shoes because they have different soles. Um, and they're more like curved. And then I'm going to share, this is a rock climbing harness it's supposed to look like this where you're supposed to have someone uh you're attached to a rope in the front and then you put your two legs here and basically you use this to uh climb safely up walls <laughs> um so that is my little show and tell of outdoor recreation um how about you alessa what do you have to share to for us <laughs> Um, well, one of my favorite things to do, uh, we've talked a lot about hiking and backpacking, but I have fallen in love with what I like to call bike packing. Um, <laughs> so like backpacking, except for instead of walking with everything on your back, you've got a bunch of bags on the back of your bike and you're biking around. It's faster. Um, <laughs> you get to see a lot more and your back doesn't hurt, obviously, um, but your legs do. Uh, <laughs> and is this the alternative to, is this the alternative to like an unsized backpack? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe I was, you know, secretly, you know, I'm still thinking about that a uh, horrible time when I had to carry a backpack that didn't fit well, but um, anyway, I didn't bring my bike, but when you ride on these really long trips and you're going the whole day, you make stops, pictures, lunch. I always take like a little um, tiny uh, watercolor set and usually sit around and paint watercolors. Um, but your butt really hurts if you sit on the seat for hours and hours and hours. So you wear these really funny shorts and they have like this nice cushy padding in the butt area and on the front area. <laughs> And it's like really thick and it feels like you're wearing a diaper. Um, <laughs> on the bike, it's super comfortable, but as soon as you get off and walk around, it's really not comfortable. Um, my favorite thing to do is take a really simple skirt on me with me. And every time I stop, I just take my bike shorts off. I put my skirt on, take my bike shorts off, and it's like totally fine. I don't need a changing room, nothing, you know, <laughs> like it works perfectly. Um, but my new favorite activity, bike packing. Very cool. <laughs> uh, Danny, how about you? Your show and tell item. Yes. Oh my God, Alyssa. I would wear those bike shorts like every day. So to make my booty like really pop, I think you're, I think you should really capitalize on these bike shorts, but for my show and tell, 
I have here my bear can. This is a medium size. It can come in smaller sizes. It can come in uh, larger sizes, but I have like the medium size. It was $50 at REI. So it was definitely a major purchase for me. And it can fit like a good amount of food. So a bear can, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a really um, hardcore like plastic container with this interesting like lock mechanism which prevents bears from getting into your food bears in national parks like sequoia yosemite um uh, i'm talking more about black bears they like to raid campsites and grab any goodies that campers have out and so people have to have a bear can with them in order to store all their like food and goodies and um yeah it's just a really nifty container and i like having all my snacks in here so that the bears don't eat them. Awesome. Have you encountered a bear? You know what? I have not. In all my years <laughs> of backpacking and camping, I have never seen a bear, um, which is so shocking to me because they are actually kind of like common, I would say. But yeah, I've just never been blessed. Uh, better safe than sorry, I would say. <laughs> so it's always good to have that gear. Well, thank you again, ladies. This has been a lot of fun. And, you know, we are in uh, May, so it's getting warmer out there. So maybe I'll see you guys outdoors and all decked out in our like bike pants and bear cans and climbing shoes. <laughs> um, and thanks for being part of this conversation about uh, being outdoors. Yeah, thank you, Helen, for facilitating this. It's so much fun to talk about being outside. I really, I really just want everybody to be there. <laughs>